God's blessings on the faithful and the obedient in Jesus Christ, the righteousness of the Father. May the Spirit of God guide you into all truth with the doctrine that I preach to you. I am Brother Joseph Herbert. I want to get on here and talk about the zeal of the Lord. As yesterday's video that I did, I talked about the zeal of the Lord as well. Uh, there's more to it. There's more to zeal. What is zeal? Zeal is a strong devotion to a purpose or a goal. Zeal is your intentions and determination to do something. And you are very determined to get it done. So the zeal of the Lord, I talked about yesterday. A person can be out of the will of God and have zeal and also... A person who is of the in the will of God can be zealous as well. So who is an example of somebody who is who it can be out of the will of God, who was out of the will of God and is zealous? Paul the Apostle. I talked about yesterday in Acts chapter 22. Uh, Paul reiterated his testimony of he said that he was zealous for God. And yet. He was persecuting the Christians, persecuting those who preached the way, and he he took it as blasphemous because all the years of being a Pharisee and studying in the law, he says he was zealous for God and the people that he preached it to were against him. And he says, I was zealous for God just like you all are. But all of them were wrong. And Paul, who was Saul at the time, Saul of Tarsus, he was wrong in his doings or his work, working iniquity. So you, that's why he wrote Galatians and other, uh, the letters that he wrote, the epistles, 1 Corinthians, 2 Corinthians, and uh, Romans especially, and Galatians especially. So he preached about you cannot be saved by the law alone. It's the law by faith. It's the law by Christ. He said it in Galatians chapter 6. He mentions about the law of Christ. As I turn there. He says in verse, verse 2. I'm going to read verse 1 so you can get the context. So it says, this is Galatians chapter 6 verse 1. It says, brethren, if a man be overtaken in a fault, you which are spiritual restore such a one. In the spirit of meekness, considering yourself, lest you also be tempted. Then he says, bear ye one another's burdens. So and so also. So and so fulfill the law of Christ. Now, what is the law of Christ? The law of Christ is the fulfilled law. Jesus in the Sermon on the Mount. As the word defines Matthew chapter five. Through chapter 7 and there's Luke the Sermon on the Mount Jesus Christ will say things that for an example he says now you heard that it has been said that you should not you shall not commit adultery but I say that whosoever looks at a woman to lust after her has already committed adultery in with that person in his heart so he's fulfilling the law because the law of Moses said just directly says do not commit adultery it also says you have the ten commandments but there are the laws that moses had have said jesus christ fulfilled the law he said it in john chapter 15 as the father loved me so have i loved you continue in my love if you can if you keep my commandments you will abide in my love just as I have kept my father's commandments and abide in his love. So he says he kept his father's commandments. That the commandments are God's holy law. So man cannot keep the law. Paul emphasized that in the letters. Romans and Galatians and a little bit of uh, Corinth, uh, first or second Corinthians. See, he did emphasize that in those those epistles. So yeah, he went on about keeping the law. So you have to be zealous. What is the zeal of the Lord? The zeal of the Lord 
that many says, uh, many uh, scriptures that come to mind. I did emphasize Isaiah chapter 9, and it is a very powerful verse. It prophesies about Christ being born. It is also a cross reference with John 3.16. It, you know, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. He gave his God, the father gave his only begotten son as his love for the world. He died for the godly and the ungodly. But the fact that he gave his only begotten son, which is a cross reference with Isaiah chapter nine unto us, a child is born and unto us, a son is given and the government is will be upon his shoulder and his name shall be called wonderful counselor the mighty god the everlasting father the prince of peace and of the increase of his government and peace there shall be no end upon the throne of david and his kingdom to order it and to establish it with judgment and with justice from henceforth even forever then it says the zeal of the lord of hosts will perform this so the Lord Jesus Christ is who is the example of who we shall follow. Why? He's perfect. He had favor with the Father and with man. He did all things that pleased the Father. When you are in Christ, let me rephrase that. The man of God in Christ, abiding in Jesus, does things that please the Father. Do, always does those things that please the Father. Why? Because the man of God is in Christ. The woman, the woman of God is in Christ. Uh, we are made in his image and his likeness. So in Christ, that's why he said, abide in me and I abide in you. The branch does not bear fruit of itself except it abide in the vine. Jesus Christ is the root and the offspring of David. He is the brightness of the Father's glory. So abiding in Jesus Christ by following him, obeying him, obeying truth of God's word, you're pleased, you're well pleased by the Father. That means you're going to prosper. That means you're going to have direction according to his will. His will is to be done as in heaven, so in the earth. So you have to understand something here that... You cannot, now, apart from salvation, you can't do nothing to get into heaven. You must be born again. You can't do nothing. You can't earn your way into heaven. You can't, no good works that you do apart from salvation, apart from the straight and narrow way, you can't get into heaven. So, what must I do to be saved? What must I do to get into heaven? You have to repent. You have to repent by denying your own self, denying your own good deeds, your personal goals, denying what you love doing and turn to Christ for redemption. Turn to Jesus Christ for the cleansing and the renewing of your mind. Baptized in the Holy Ghost with fire of his spirit and with water. And I'm not talking about literal fire. I'm talking about spiritual fire, Holy Ghost and fire. John the Baptist, John the Baptist said that. Uh, there's one who, who comes mightier than I who sent him straps. I am not worthy to stoop down and unloose. He, you know, I baptize with water unto repentance, but he comes and baptizes with the Holy Ghost and fire. That's Matthew chapter 3. Uh, John the Baptist has said that. So there are two baptisms here. Now, Jesus Christ says in John chapter 3, except the man be born of the water and the spirit, he cannot enter into the kingdom of God. So notice that your purpose in life is to commit to Jesus Christ. That's the meaning of life. And because you, you have to understand something here. Your, your misunderstanding of life is your purpose. Why are you born? Why are you alive? You know, these thoughts come to mind 
When you don't know God personally, when you don't have a relationship with God personally, questions come to mind. Who am I? Where am I going? What's the meaning of life? And all the answers to those questions to those questions is found in Jesus Christ alone. Jesus Christ. It, it, it points to it. You know, in a in a video, I forgot how long ago I did it like probably like two months ago, maybe a month and a half ago, I did a video and I talked about growing up, I watched a Jesus movie and it was like compared to everything else I was watching, watching you know Transformers and all these other cartoons that I used, that I used to watch and shows that I used to watch, but then I watch a Jesus movie, and then the person who's playing Jesus is actually saying the words of Jesus. So the word of God is being said here, but it's what is this? I couldn't understand or fathom what's grabbing my attention to this person who is playing this part and saying these words growing up watching a Jesus movie what is something interesting compared to everything else that I was watching uh growing up what is what is this this is interesting and I wouldn't express that but in my mind I wondered it was drawing me and I kept on watching it so it was the Lord Jesus Christ the Lord God Almighty in the flesh Saying, you need to listen so my seed can be planted in you. Isaiah 61 puts it like this. He, he, he talks about, the Lord talks about the planting of the Lord, the trees of righteousness. And Psalms chapter 4 says this. I was meditating on this. So, this is the purpose of zeal. He's, Psalms chapter 4 verses 3. It says, but know that the Lord has set apart him. That is godly for himself. The Lord will hear when I call to him. Doesn't that sound like the calling? You're, you're believing on the Lord. You're believing and you're, you're, you're trusting. You're, there's, there's a seed being planted when you read words or scriptures like this. Seed is being planted. Jesus Christ says the seed is the word of God. And I got to read that again because it has to impact something in your heart. But know that the Lord has set apart him that is godly for himself. The Lord will hear when I call to him. And it says, stand in awe and sin not. So David is talking about sin here. Stand in awe and sin not. Commune with your own heart upon your bed and be still. Selah. Selah means to pause, to ponder on what is being said, what is being meditated on. So, God saves a person for himself and by himself without Jesus Christ, without the word of God, without God Almighty, maker of heaven and earth. Nothing exists. Nothing was made. That was made. All things was made by God and for God. All things consist, according to Colossians chapter 3, or chapter one, one of those two verses, two chapters, all things consist. Jesus Christ made all things. Now, how can a man make all things? It's simple. You follow Jesus. When you follow Jesus, and I don't, don't, I don't say that loosely. I want you to understand something here. And I'm gonna go to John chapter six because there's some things that you need to understand because there's so many people in the world that don't believe that. Jesus Christ is God. How can a man, how can a man, you know, many miraculous impossibilities that that God performed that happened. To man it's impossible, but to God all things are possible. You have the miraculous conception that the fact that Christ, God, became a human being born from a virgin, fully God, fully man, without sin, the spotless Lamb of God, born. Into this world, you you would think, how can a man form the earth? It says in Hebrews chapter one that he upholds everything. It's talking about Jesus. He upholds everything by the words of his power. When Jesus Christ speaks, power is being transmitted to impact you and 
empower you to do to to come to him for salvation. If you choose to not follow what is being said or obey him, if you choose not to do it, if you choose to reject the truth, the truth will reject you on the day of judgment. And the truth is a person. Jesus Christ says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. John chapter 6 puts it like this. I like the way he describes the will of God. Now, I'm going I'm to read verse 26. Matter of fact, to get the context, verse 25, it says, And when they had found him on the other side of the sea, they said unto him, Rabbi, when did you come here? Jesus answers and said to them, Verily, verily, I say unto you, you seek me not because you saw the miracles, but because you did eat of the loaves and were filled because he felt he fed the thousands. He fed the five thousands and the seven thousands. John chapter six is is demonstrated and worded differently, but he fed the he fed the thousands. So he Jesus Christ says, labor not for that meat which perishes, but labor for that meat which endures to everlasting life. They didn't know he was talking about his flesh and not just the flesh like the epidermis or your skin, but he's talking about by the spirit. Labor not for the meat that perishes, which perishes, but for that meat which endures to everlasting life, which the son of man will give to you for him has God the father sealed. He sealed him, uh, the son. And it says in verse 28, they said, then they said to him, what shall we do that we might work the works of God? So he thought they can work the works of God and earn everlasting life or earn uh, an inheritance with God Almighty to spend forever with him. Because everyone wants to go to heaven by rejecting truth, by rejecting Christ. Everybody wants to go to heaven. They just don't want God to be there when they get there. The devil would like to go back to heaven as long as he doesn't have to bow his knee to God. The devil would like to go back to heaven, but guess what? He can't, he won't, and he will never will be. He, you know, everybody wants to go to heaven, but how do you get to heaven? Jesus Christ explains, yet they did not have the ears to hear because of the hard saying in this chapter. I'm not going to read the whole chapter, but they said this. They said to him, what shall we do that we might work the works of God? Jesus answered and said to them, this is the work of God that you believe on him whom he has sent. Meaning, believe everything he says. Believe the works that he does. Believe the doctrine that is being preached. And guess what? When you believe, you will be preserved for Jesus Christ and on your way to heaven. He says this, then said therefore unto him, what sign do you show us then? So they're looking for a sign. Jesus reproves the Pharisees in uh, the the other three gospels, Mark and John, I believe he said it in Luke 2, um, this wicked and adulterous generation seeks after a sign, but no sign will be given but the son of the prophet Jonah. So Jonah, yes, he was in the well, the belly of a well, a great fish. Jonah says a great fish. Jesus Christ, Jesus Christ calls it a well. So no sign will be given but the son of the prophet Jonah. Jonah was in the great fish as a prophecy of the death of Christ Jesus going into the belly of the earth for three days, rising on the third day by the power of the Father with great power and great glory, forever defeating sin, death, and destroyed, destroyed the works of the devil. All dominion belongs to God. All power belongs to God. So he says, the, the people says, our fathers did eat manna in the desert as it is written. He gave them bread from having to eat. They're trying to quote the word to the word of God. Jesus Christ is the word of God. They try to quote the word to the word of God, just like the devil. It, the devil says it is written in the temptation in the wilderness. It is written that if you jump off the stone, lest the angels catch you or lest you dash your foot against the stone. He wanted Jesus Christ to commit suicide, tempting him to do uh, suicide. And Jesus Christ rebuked him with the word. It is written also, you should not tempt the Lord your God. So they give him the word. 
they said our fathers did eat manna in the desert as it is written. He gave them bread from heaven to eat. Then Jesus said to them, verily, verily, I say to you, Moses gave you not that bread from heaven, but my father gives you the true bread from heaven. He's not talking about the past. He's talking about right now, right in their vicinity, in their presence. He says, I'm going to read that again. Verily, verily, I say to you, Moses gave you not that bread from heaven, but my father gives you that tr the true bread from heaven. For the bread of God is he which comes down from heaven and gives you life unto the world. So they did not understand that saying. You have, I'm not, Like I said, I'm not going to read the whole thing right here because it's a lengthy chapter. But understand something when you are... When you have everlasting life, when you are granted eternal life by, by you believing on Christ, turning from your evil deeds. And it, why do I call it evil? Because your, your own deeds, your own personal goals in life is evil because man thinks they're good. Man thinks they are a good person. The Bible says, Romans chapter 3 and Paul was quoting from Psalms 14 and Psalms 52. There is none that does good. No, not one. So, you, you know, I could be at a uh, school event and I will hear a parent say to the child, good job. I'm so proud of you, you know, knowing not what they say. To be proud is not the Lord. And I'm not just saying to be condescending, but to call somebody good, you have to understand that word good means moral perfection. So they may say that the, the, the genuine mm, kindness of their heart and it could be right in their own eyes. And I say the reason I say their own eyes because it's their own understanding of good, but to God. The person's not good. May, they may have done a good deed, but they're not a good person unless you are committed to Jesus Christ. And that's that's the only way you, you are good. I made an example. I, well, not made an example. I referenced an example of the rich and ruler. He come to Jesus Christ and says, good teacher, how can I earn eternal life? And Jesus Christ replies, why do you call me good? There's only one that is good, but God. And not him not even knowing that Jesus Christ is God. But that's an example there. So you cannot be a good person by your own works, by your own standard to earn everlasting life. The rich young ruler thought he can do that. And he was proven wrong. So that's why he walked away sorrowfully. He didn't want to give up his possessions and his riches. Notice that the rich and ruler did not, the Lord did not give him a name in the Bible because he walked away sorrowful, sorrowful. He walked away from the only true living God who, ha, who is the way to the, to, to the kingdom of God, who is the way to heaven, who is the way to everlasting life. He forsook it by walking away sorrowful. There are, there are many sorrowful people that are in hell. You would think that is harsh. That is stern. How can God do that? You cannot question God in that manner. God is sovereign. He does what he wants. And you have to understand something here. It's according to his standards that you are able to get in. So God is also merciful. And to say that God is jealous you have to understand this too. He's not jealous according to man's flesh. He's jealous because he's righteous and he loves you. And he does not want you to turn to any other resource, any other false religion, any other idol, nobody else for salvation or for good hopes in life. He wants you to turn to him because if you go somewhere else, if you reject God's will for your life, for, for a spouse, for a boyfriend and girlfriend, or uh, a game, uh, NFL game, playoffs, lottery tickets, whatever the case, you turn your heart to that and not to Jesus Christ, you will not spend forever with God. Because 
The fact that you love things that God hates, it proves that you are righteous in your own eyes. Your righteousness is as filthy rags. So the zeal of the Lord, you have God is a reward to them that diligently seek him. And what do I mean by that? Jesus Christ commands in Matthew chapter 6 to seek first the kingdom of God and all of his righteousness and all these things will be added. All what things, brother Joseph, let me explain. All the things that God wants to bless you with, the prosperity of his favor on you in this life. Because when you obey and are faithful to God every day, meditating on his word day and night, Psalm chapter 1 God's word promises that you will be like a tree planted by a by the rivers of water that brings forth his fruit in his season and his leaf also will not wither and whatsoever you do, you will prosper. The ungodly are not so, but are like the chaff that the wind drives away. The ungodly will not stand in the judgment nor sinners in the congregation of the righteous. What's congregation, Brother Joseph? The church, the gathering of the saints, the unified body of, the, of Christ Jesus, and those that are worshiping Jesus Christ in spirit and in truth. The healthy church. There are many churches on planet Earth. Not all are healthy. So to be zealous is... To be determined to do right in Christ Jesus by pleasing him, by preaching the word. Paul says in his 2 Timothy chapter 4, he commanded by the Holy Ghost, preach the word. Be instant in season and out of season. Reprove, rebuke, and exhort with all long suffering and doctrine. What is doctrine, brother? Joseph? Doctrine is collective teachings, especially the doctrine of the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ is collective teachings. This is why you study to show yourself approved unto God, unto God, not unto man, because the man of God does not seek honor of man. And Christ made that very clear in the gospel. He did not seek the honor of man. He didn't want to be king. They tried to make him a king in John chapter 6 and Jesus Christ made a way to escape from these people because of the wickedness of their own heart. They try to do that with Gideon in Judges, uh, I believe it's chapter 6, if I'm not mistaken. Gideon, uh, was he did right in the eyes of God and they went to him and his sons and his son's sons to rule over them. And so... Gideon was like, I will not rule over you. No, my sons rule over you. No, my son's sons rule over you. The Lord will rule over you. And so Gideon already knew. Just like in uh, 1 Samuel, the the child, the Israel, the men of Israel wanted a king. And because of their own, they want they wanted their own king just like the other nations. They didn't want God to be their king because God is holy. And this angered God. So the prophet Samuel goes to the Lord and tells them all what the, what the men of Israel want. They wanted a king. And God gave them a king, but he gave them out of his anger. That's what the word of God says. And out of his anger, they gave him a king just like themselves, King Saul. King Saul was... Okay, I'm going to use that word, for two years until he rebelled against God. He rejected the will of God for his life by not obeying, by not killing the Amalekites, which the Lord had remembered, not uh, killing all the animals, the oxen and the sheep. The Lord said, kill everything and everyone. And what did King Saul do? He came back and spared Agag. He spared a few oxen and sheep for the sacrifices unto the Lord. Something that the prophet Samuel does and not the king. And then he blames the people. He, he says, he, I fear the people. And he tried to repent, but it was already too late for him. It was already too late for King Saul. God cursed him. God rendered the kingdom 
and gave it to David, the son of Jesse. And, and it's interesting because Samuel said that the Lord has found someone better than you. Now, for someone, for the Lord to say that to a prideful heart or a fearful heart or one who is out of the will of God, the Lord has found somebody better than you. That has to do something to you to make you jealous. So it describes a spirit, one of the evil spirits. The Lord sent an evil spirit to King Saul because of his disobedience, because he did not obey the Lord through the prophet Samuel. And then Saul requested King David, not King David, I'm sorry, David, the son of Jesse. This was before he was a king. Saul uh, needed someone to uh, play a, a musical instrument, the harp. And David came and played the harp and the, devil, the evil spirit left Saul. So that's the first example of the cast now of devils. However, there was more open doors for Saul for evil spirits to come again onto him. Because as Jesus Christ puts it, when the enemy uh, leaves the house, I'm paraphrasing. When the enemy leaves the house and he comes back and finds it swept and clean, he takes with him seven more spirits wicked than himself, and then they all come in. So the second time that King Saul had an evil spirit, and when David tried to play the harp to get rid of the evil spirits, this time... Saul tries to kill, he, he throws a javelin at David. And he also threw a javelin at his son, Jonathan. And you know, this is an example of, or discernment rather, that evil spirits, the spirit realm is real. You have to understand that something. Most professed Christians do not believe that. And it's understandable why. But why should you not believe that? But just believe the doctrine itself. You know, I, I, I've been in many debates early in my faith. Uh, oh, the gift of tongues is gibberish. Or, you know, the person, the professed Christian who I used to fellowship with, they never talked about casting out the devils. They never go beyond that point. They think the gifts of healing is passed away. When Paul clearly said in 1 Corinthians chapter 14, I wish that all would speak, to, speak in tongues or uh, forbid not for those who to speak in tongues. To be zealous for God's glory, to be zealous you're, and, and, and oh, by obeying, by faith in God, you're going to do well. God's going to prosper you, I'm telling you. And then when you look back at the people who said these things, who was against the works of God, the miraculous works of God, Jesus Christ always said these things for, to those who will believe, for those who don't did not believe early in your faith, they're in worse conditions. You see the darkness on them manifesting. You see they look like the world. They don't look nothing holy. This is truth. This is truth here. Holiness is right. The word of God is right. Holiness unto the Lord. You don't need to be in seminary. You don't need to be in any institution. If you are a man of God, you have the Holy Ghost. Guess what the Holy Ghost is supposed to do? Guide you into all truth, as it says in John chapter 16. Guide you into all truth. Reprove the world of sin, righteousness, and judgment. That's what Jesus Christ himself said. So, any other things is, any other thing is idolatry. Please understand that. So, the zeal of the Lord of hosts will perform this. Isaiah 9 makes that very clear. The zeal of the Lord of hosts will perform it. Yes, it's talking about Christ Jesus. It didn't really talk about the, the death and resurrection. Isaiah 53 explains that. Um, by his wounds and stripes, we are healed. The chastisement of our peace was on him. He was, uh, what he said, what it says, uh, it pleased God to bruise his seed, meaning it pleased the father to bruise his son. That's what was happening on that on Calvary when Jesus Christ was hanging on the cross between two male factors. And, you know, he was he was treated as if he was a criminal. He did nothing wrong. He did nothing wrong. He was perfect in thought, word, and deed. And 
He grew as a tender plant and a root out of a dry ground, meaning he grew in all perfection and all wisdom, all favor before God and man. And so when he began his ministry, and what, as recorded, he it says he, he's, the first thing that came out of his mouth was repent for the kingdom of God is at hand. As it says in Mark, I believe that's Mark or I believe that's Mark. Let me see that. Let me turn it real fast. He says, now Mark, the gospel of Mark does not go into the temptation in the wilderness uh, as well as Luke's gospel and Matthew's gospel. But he says, the time is fulfilled. So yeah, chapter one of Mark, the gospel of Mark. And it says in verse 15 and saying, the time is fulfilled and the kingdom of God is at hand. Repent and believe the gospel. These are the very first words that came out of Jesus Christ's Jesus Christ's mouth in the Gospel of Mark. It does say that he, let me see. It does says he got tempted by the devil, but it didn't expound uh, just like Matthew and Luke did or what the devil said to Jesus Christ. But when he came out of the wilderness, it says the time, Jesus Christ says the time is fulfilled and the kingdom of God is at hand. Repent and believe the gospel. He walked. He walked the Sea of Galilee. He saw Simon Andrew and his brother casting a net into the sea, for they were fishers. And Jesus said to them, Come after me, and I will make you fishers of men. Become fishers of men. That means he's going to give them authority. He's going to give them doctrine. He's going to, by following Christ Jesus, you're going to learn of him. And you're gonna, and if you believe, you're gonna agree with everything he says, and everything that he says comes to pass. It will manifest. So, towards the end of Mark 16, what did Christ Jesus say? All these things, and I'm gonna read it right here. I don't, I don't want to just quote it. I gotta read it because, again, and I, when I say this, I'm not being condescending or disrespectful when I say this. Brother Joseph did not write the Bible. It says it right here. Jesus Christ says, go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. You and I are a creature. If any man believe, if any man be in Christ, he's a new creature. All things have been passed away. Behold, all things become new. Verse 16, he that believes and is baptized shall be saved, but he that believes not shall be damned. You believe not the, the God's will for your life. You believe not on Jesus Christ. You will be damned. You'll be, you're condemned already when you don't believe. If you don't believe, you're condemned already. You're damned already. And it says, and these signs will follow them that believe. In my name will they cast out devils. That's what it says. They shall speak with new tongues. That's the heavenly language. That's the unknown language Paul mentioned in 1 Corinthians chapter 14. Verse 18 says, They shall take up serpents, and if they, if, now listen, it's not saying when they drink. It says, if they drink, if they drink any deadly thing, it shall no hurt, it shall not hurt them. They shall lay hands on the sick, and they shall recover. So I have many testimonies of. Myself laying on my, laying hands on my son and a few people in my faith, and they recovered. They recovered. The power of God is available for the man of God, and when man the man of God believes, then God is glorified. God is exalted as Lord and Savior and and Redeemer. So, when we do well in the body of Christ. He is a rewarder to them that diligently seek him. What is the presence of God to you? Well, the presence of God to me is my time with the Lord, prayer, supplication, interceding. Uh, if I stumble in areas and or ignorant in areas that I have disobeyed in, I repent because I have an advocate with the Father. Lord, I'm sorry for doing this thing that I was in ignorance and foolishness. I'm sorry, Father God. I repent. Show me your ways every day. Guide me into all truth by your spirit. 
in Jesus name. I you this is how you repent. This is how you turn from evil deeds. You have to have a heart for righteousness and fear the Father, fear God Almighty. The fear of the Lord is clean, enduring forever. And the judgments of the Lord are true and righteous altogether. And guess what it says? More it is more to be desired than gold. Yes, than much fine gold, sweeter than honey and the honeycomb. Moreover, is your servant warned in keeping of them? There is great reward. Now, who can understand his error? Cleanse me from secret faults. Keep me back for pres presumptuous sins. Let them not have dominion over me. Then I will be upright and innocent from the, from the great transgression. Then it says in Psalm 19, this is what I'm quoting. Let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable to you, my God, my Redeemer, and my strength. So your heart toward your passion towards God in prayer. This is how it's supposed to look in the presence. You give your you give God Almighty your heart, all of your heart, all of your mind and concerns and burdens, all of you, all of your strength, so you do not enter in lazy. The lazy will not make it in. You have to be diligent. The zeal of the Lord of hosts will perform this. Your zeal is, it, it brings God glory, especially if you are in righteousness. Again, I made mention before, you can be zealous and be out of the will of God. So Paul the apostle was an example of that because he reiterated in Acts chapter 22. He says he was zealous for God and he was, per, and then he went on to about persecuting Christians. He was not he was not in the will of God. He was just zealous for the law of God and the things that he grew up learning of. But when he got saved, when Christ Jesus uh, spoke out of heaven with a great light shining around about him on the road to Damascus, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? Who are you, Lord? I am Jesus whom you persecute. It is hard for you to kick against the pricks, meaning it is hard for you to kick against the goats or the, the sharp edges, you know, he's he's he, he's talking about it is hard for you to go against my will for your life. It is hard to, to go against the grain. It is hard for you to go against my people who are doing my will and obeying my voice. It is hard for you to persecute the righteous. You're, you cannot do it. What must I do? This was the first response that Paul said. What is my what is, must I do? Jesus Christ gave him instructions and he was blinded because of the great light. The Lord sends Ananias, not Ananias, the, the one. Now, this is after they, uh, the Lord smet, smitten Ananias and Sapphira. This is another Ananias. Ananias, the Lord sends Ananias and baptizes Saul and Saul gets filled with the Holy Ghost. Now he's preaching Jesus Christ. Now he has zeal. And the Lord changes his name from Saul to Paul. Now he's an apostle. The zeal of the Lord looks like the apostle Paul because most of the New Testament is Paul's writings. That's an example of the zeal of the Lord. And the word of God is is quick and powerful it is sharper than any two-edged sword piercing even the dividing asunder of soul and of spirit of joint and of marrow and is a discerner of the thoughts and the intentions of the heart so the word was on the apostle paul to do the will of god and when we see the works that are written in the word we see the power of god as instructions to follow Christ Jesus and God the Father and His Spirit, the three are one. Now understand, understand this: when you obey truth, truth will set you free from whatever sin you was inbound in. Truth will set you free. Zeal will set you free by doing truth. And when you believe on truth. God can do miraculous works in you, um, a great measures of his anointing on your life so that God can use you 
for his glory. So to obey is better than sacrifice. Now, I got to quote Revelation 3 again. Not just by verbatim, but reading it. Jesus Christ speaks to the church of Laodicea. That is the lukewarm church. Can a Christian be lukewarm? Yes, he can be lukewarm. How can he be lukewarm? When he says he believes, but he, does th he does things that is not the will of God. He watches things that is not the will of God. He says things and talks by coarse gesturing that is not the will of God. When I say that, I'm talking about joking inappropriately. Or talk about things that he ought not to talk about. Or he, he is a busybody or he's a gossiper. Many, many examples of what a compromised Christian looks like. And if you're a compromise and die in, as a compromised Christian, according to the word of God, Jesus Christ says God will spew you out of his mouth. He says in Revelation chapter 3, Jesus Christ says, I know your works now. Notice that all things are naked and open to God because he's, he's made all things. He's made you and I after his image and likeness. He's made you and I for himself and by himself. He knows you. He knows your secret thoughts. He knows the inner chambers of your heart, what you're going to do, what you're going to do tomorrow. He knows everything beyond that point and beyond that point and so on and so forth because he's God. He says, I know your works that you are neither cold nor hot. I would or I wish you were cold or hot. So then because you are lukewarm and neither cold nor hot, I will spew you out of my mouth. He says, I will, meaning I will vomit you out because you think about something that tastes or you drink something that's lukewarm, that is bitter to your your, your, your taste, especially if you're thirsty, real, real thirsty, you drink something warm, it's not going to take, you're going to spit it, you're going to spew it out. You're going to vomit it out. And so Jesus Christ is saying, because you're neither cold nor hot, you yet because you're lukewarm and you don't want to be cold because cold is just complete one who is directly rejecting God's will, not professing that they are Christian. If you're hot, you're on fire for Christ. So because you are neither cold nor hot, Jesus Christ says, I will spew you or spit you or vomit you out of my mouth because you say, I am rich and be increased with goods and have need of nothing. That sounds like the rich man and Lazarus. Well, rich man, pretty much. The rich man was, he fared sumptuously. He lived his life according to his possessions and riches, and he treated the poor with rigor. By his attitude and his behavior. And he died in unrighteousness and in torments. And God Almighty allowed the rich man to see Lazarus afar off in the in paradise. In Abraham's bosom. And he allowed him to see Abraham within the torments. And while he's experiencing tormenting. He's requesting Lazarus to dip the tip of his finger in water to cool his tongue. So that's describing there is no water in hell. There is nothing good in hell. All the good attributes goes with God. God is good. Apart from God is evil. Apart from God is bad. Apart from God is unrighteousness and iniquity. All the bad is in hell. All the evil is in hell. Your most dark imaginations that can possibly come to mind is there. That's why the, the writers like Stephen King can write the horror movies and you got the horror movies that um, describing the monsters and stuff like that. Uh, what's the Stan Lee, uh, the Incredible Hulk, the spider Man's all these evil characters come from an evil imagination because they know not God. They know not God. Stephen King is still writing horror movies. Still wicked. I don't even know if he's still alive. I'm I'm not sure. But he you can understand the imagination of man's heart is continually growing evil. That's what it says in Genesis chapter six. And when when the flood when the Lord flooded the earth. And so 
I, Jesus Christ, the resurrected Jesus Christ says, because you said, I am rich and increased with goods and have need of nothing and know not that you are wretched and miserable and poor, blind and naked. So again, the rich man was in torments. He's, the Lord allows him to see Lazarus and Abraham afar off. And he wanted grace. He wanted, uh, he wanted, okay, I did not know that. Thank you, Sister Liberty. I did not know that. So yes, the rich man was allowed to see Lazarus and uh, Abraham afar off while he's in torments. And then he requests, um, send him back to my five brothers that are alive and tell him not to come back, come to this place. And Abraham says, son, they have Moses and the prophets. Let your brothers hear them. And then he says, no, Father Abraham. He's telling Abraham in Abraham's bosom in paradise, no, Abraham, no, Father Abraham. But if you send somebody from the dead here, they're going to believe. And Abraham was like, if they don't hear Moses and the prophets, how would they believe? So, yet, Jesus Christ is alive. Jesus Christ is alive today. He is seated at the right hand of the Father. He knows them that trust in him. People think that Jesus Christ is dead. The Catholics, they have the Catholic cross with Jesus on the cross still. Jesus Christ is alive. They have you no, know, that's why all false religions are an abomination to the Lord. Your relationship and your religion in Christ Jesus is to be a Christian. Christ like. That's what Christian means. Christ like. Everything is Christ Jesus centered. Jesus Christ is God in the flesh. Jesus Christ is the everlasting Father. Jesus Christ is the mighty God as it was prophesied in Isaiah chapter 9. And so, if they don't now, and of course, the rich man and Lazarus, this is before Christ Jesus had died and resurrected. So, that's why you have Abraham's bosom, all the righteous men that died before Christ, from Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, King David, Samuel, Ezekiel, Isaiah, just to name a few, Nahum the prophet, they are there. There was in Abraham's bosom until Christ defeated sin and death and destroyed the works of the devil. And now they're in heaven with Jesus Christ. However, Elijah and Moses had, God gave them power to be, to minister to Jesus Christ. That's why you had the transfiguration of the mount. When Christ is on the mountain, his, his garments was glistering white and Peter wanted to make them a tabernacle for Moses and Elijah and for, for Christ. And then a voice came from heaven and fear came upon Peter. And this is my beloved, beloved son, hear him. So we follow Jesus Christ and we do it with great zeal. The zeal of the Lord of hosts will perform it. So let me get to this part right here. So Jesus Christ, the resurrected Jesus says in in Revelation chapter 3, he says in verse 18, I counsel you to buy of me gold tried in the fire that you may be rich in white raiment. Now he's talking about your believing on Christ, your, your baptism of the spirit and, and fire of the, and of the Holy Ghost. You're buying of him tried in the fire because he, he was tried in the fire. The, the tribulations of this world the the torments of him going to the cross you know he was he had nails in his hands and feet crown of thorns plaited on his head he was bruised scorched severely afflicted for for his glory and to please the father it pleased the father to bruise his seed now you let me ask you this if god who is holy who is true the father did that to his only begotten son. Sinner, what do you think he would do with you on the day of judgment? And that's the question. So I'm going to hurry and close this out because I want to 
get to this point right here. So he says, I counsel you to buy of me gold tried in the fire that you may be rich and white raiment that you may be clothed in that the shame of your nakedness do not appear and anoint your eyes with eye salve. Jesus Christ, meaning he will open the eyes of the blind that you may see as many as I love. Listen closely. As many as I love, I rebuke and chasten. Then he says, be zealous, therefore, and repent. That's a commandment by the Lord Jesus Christ. So you need to be zealous. He rewards the zeal of your obedience and faith in him. He is a rewarder to those who diligently seek him so that you can spend forever with him. You grow in the grace and the knowledge of God Almighty and the Lord Jesus Christ in this life so that you can maintain and obtain eternal life by enduring to the end. I am Brother Joseph Herbert and this is For His Glory.